Almost exactly a, ye- a decade ago, it was Mario Draghi, the then president of the European Central Bank, who famously promised to do whatever it takes to save the euro from destruction at the time. Greece was on the verge of stumbling or being frog-marched out of the European single currency. And Italy, the eurozone's third largest economy, was so mired in debt that it too was in danger of sparking the currency bloc's collapse, threatening to spread financial turmoil across the globe. Well, ten years on, the same Mario Draghi, he's now Prime Minister of Italy, which is even more highly indebted than it was, with government debt exceeding 150% of GDP, compared to around 100% here in the UK, and that's still pretty high. And there are once again growing fears and signs on global bond markets that as inflation rises and the European Central Bank starts to raise interest rates, we could see a renewed Eurozone crisis, which again could spark a wider financial meltdown. Well, joining me in the studio today is Gordon Kerr. He's a highly experienced banker who specialises in debt capital markets. Gordon advised various Eurozone governments during the last crisis and is a leading authority on the structure of the single currency. So here he is, financial analyst extraordinaire Gordon Kerr, my latest guest on Money Talks. Gordon, great to have you here in the studio We've known each other for a long time. We've often talked about the Eurozone. You were very much involved with the last Eurozone crisis. You were advising lots of Eurozone governments behind the scenes on how they could weather that storm. People will remember a decade ago that it was really scary. It looked as if this huge currency block was going to break up and that would spread financial turmoil across the globe. Is that really a danger now? Um, Well, thank you, Liam. Yes, sir. It it certainly is. In fact, the only thing um, that I would disagree with, a small point from your very kind introduction, is that uh, this crisis really, we're not talking about a revival of the crisis. It's never gone away. As you pointed out, Mario Draghi's words 10 years ago indicated that, shall we say, the patient was in intensive care, drugs being pumped all over the place. Effectively, the printing press since then has been deployed to pump a great deal of money all over the place. And this has obviously been a situation which has been quite happily tolerated by governments very keen to um, continue to resist the exhortations of Mario Draghi when he was president of the European Central Bank for structural reforms and to reduce their spending and so forth and come back into compliance with various criteria. Far from that, they've enjoyed a situation of virtually zero interest rates, which successfully hides the fragility of their banking systems in Japanese style from the 90s. And so long as inflation stayed round about kind of non-existent, happy days. But what has significantly changed, even in the last two or three weeks, Mm. is we've entered a new phase where, the way I would phrase it, is the crisis goes from covert to overt, and people are becoming aware of it. Furthermore, the European Central Bank has clearly completely dropped the ball. They have consistently maintained that they would maintain interest rates at negative levels. Um, Now inflation is looking like plus 10% in the Eurozone. Mm. The recent approach of the European Central Bank in the last couple of weeks is to indicate forward guidance, not to actually do anything, but to Mm. indicate that they might now go along with the US Federal Reserve and start raising interest rates just at the very time when these deeply indebted countries need the support to continue in its present guise. So I think the ECB have basically mismanaged, particularly the pandemic phase. They created all these new funds, they printed money on speed, and they, they were always doing this to try to increase inflation. Their argument for the last 10 years was that the problems with the inflation wasn't high enough. That would drive the new tax revenues that would re- repay all this debt. But now inflation seems to be out of control and they're talking about doing a complete U-turn. Well, they can't do both. They can't continue to support these weak, indebted countries and increase interest rates, one thing or the other. And this is going to lead to a political lack of confidence and the cosy consensus is, I think, about to fracture. Now, these are very difficult concepts. You explain them very well, Gordon. Just to amplify what you're saying, since about 2008, eight nine, since the, the Lehman collapse, the financial crisis, big central banks across the world have expanded their balance sheets, created lots of money, the Federal Reserve in the US, our own Bank of England, and also the European Central Bank in the Eurozone. What you're saying is that the dangers of that, which are in many parts of the world, are amplified in the Eurozone because I think you believe, and lots of other people believe, that they're not often given a hearing, that the Eurozone as a concept just doesn't work. The idea of having, you know, 
many, many different countries, with many, many different elected governments, with many, many different fiscal policies, and yet just one central bank, one interest rate, one exchange rate. History shows, in your view, doesn't it, that in the end, that kind of currency block, unless it's a major current country that acts as one country, like the United States, you can't do that in Europe because there's still, even in the Eurozone, many, many different countries with different politics and different tax and spend. Is that accurate? Absolutely right. So one, one, one book that I was tempted to try to bring on to show your viewers was written in 1998, published in 1998, uh, before the euro came into in existence. A chapter in this book, Money and the Nation State, written by Kevin Dowd, a core member of our team, one of the world's leading monetary economists, working together with Charles Goodhart, another very Formerly famous Formerly from the Bank of England, Bank of, of England. course, yeah. Deputy and Governor. In 1998, they, they were writing that this euro was a currency so poorly designed, it was as if designed by infants. And the entire purpose was traced back through the treaties to the Maastricht Treaty, which, of course, kind of converted the European economic community, the trading area, into a political union. And it was crystal clear from reading Kevin Dow's chapter that the whole purpose of the design of the euro currency itself was as a kind of yoke, to, to a, a tool to yoke the cows of Europe, all the member states together. Once mm. in, there really wasn't... It was a political in, construct. A political and construct. also to look America in the eye, to try and create a reserve currency to challenge the dollar. Now, you know, as I say, we've known each other a long time. You don't come at this, you're not... You know, particularly a Eurosceptic, you're not trying to diss Europe. You spent most of your professional life working in and around yeah. Europe. You, you, you're extremely well connected across the Eurozone with many, many governments and officials and people from the banking establishment and so on. What you're saying, though, is that you think this crisis that we're going into, this cost of living crisis, this inflation crisis, this sharp upward leg in the interest rate sp uh, cycle, you're saying that could finally expose the eurozone as being ill-designed. Could we really see a collapse of the eurozone? Could we see the kind of turmoil on financial markets that we saw generated in and around the eurozone back in 2011-12? Could that return? Uh, yes, and to, to be specific, we're talking about the euro currency construct itself. And thank you, yeah, we are completely apolitical. I and all my close colleagues, John Butler, who I think you know, uh, chaps like Bob Lidd and, and, uh, and, 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 and others, and Kevin Dowd himself, uh, extremely talented people, we, we will pitch to any member state. We think the euro is likely to be the first fiat currency to have real problems. Now, we're not saying that many of the other fiat currencies um, are operating in a more brilliant way, as you say, with mm. money printing, but at least they have governance. At least here in the UK, we have a government that has legal powers to compel us to use sterling. Mm. That power does not exist in the Eurozone. There are, there are many rules which are being flouted all the time by the likes of Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and the Convention on Converting Your, your, your Fiat Currency from the Croatian Kuna, which is scheduled to be abolished. Yeah, the Eurozone's expanding, isn't expanding it? Expanding with these countries. Set the, to expand at the beginning of next year, I think. Right. But there are many reasons why it might be a good thing for Croatia to join the Eurozone, despite these issues, because only by becoming a member of the Eurozone, adopting the Euro, do you qualify for the largesse, these three trillion funds in the Asset Purchase Programme, the, the Pandemic Fund, and now, of course, the Rubicon, which has been crossed, which is the Coronavirus Recovery Fund, renamed, renamed the Next Generation EU Fund, where now for the first time the EU is printing money and donating it to member states as opposed to lending it to them, which mm -hmm. is clearly a breach of its, its mandate. We're almost out of time. We will get you on again in the autumn to see if what you're saying comes true, uh, Gordon. But just to be devil's advocate, you know I have some sympathy with your views and I've written, been writing stuff along these lines myself for 15 or 20 years, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Aren't we underestimating the amount of political will there is to keep the Eurozone together? Aren't we, as economists, underestimating the political cohesion of this bloc? I, I don't think you are un un underestimating. I think, I think of the agglomeration of the member states as like the prisoner's dilemma. Everybody knows the system is broken beyond repair, but you go along with it for so long as it suits you. It's no, no longer going to suit some of these countries, be they small countries or even Germany, Austria and the big ones. Gordon Kerr of Cobden Partners, great to have you here on The Money and we will continue this very important discussion.